Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, let's begin this study with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very grateful for all the things that you have been doing in our lives, the ministry that you have given each one of us, and the hope that you give us in this world of sin and suffering. We ask, Lord, that the things that we've talked about before the study, the, the prayer requests that we have had uh, for those that we love and that we've been ministering to, and um, uh, for the work that your Holy Spirit has been doing that we are so thankful for, um, we just ask, Lord, that um, you can continue to work and help us to continue to pray for each other and for those around us. Help us to be an influence for good. And may your Holy Spirit um, bring a conviction and a power to our lives. We thank you for these studies, um, for the precious time that we have in studying together. And we just ask that you can continue to teach us. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, we're going to continue this study. Now, I spent most of last night uh, dreaming about this study, so I don't know if I resolved anything in my dream, uh, but I kept going through it, um, which is with a lot of other things happening, because dreams are usually crazy things. But uh, um, what I was struggling with uh, in my dream was this: these lines, the, the two lines we have of, of Gideon, the two seven 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 structures. And, and in my dream, I was trying to resolve how we could possibly have these lines, that we have these two lines and how they worked. But I don't remember the details in my dream. But I do have confidence that God is gonna, has a purpose for this because uh, I, I don't think I was thinking about it before I went to bed at night. It just ended up popping up in my dream uh, and uh, kept reoccurring through all the different dreams I was having. But uh, anyway, where we had gone through Judges chapter 6 and and now we're going to look at Judges chapter 7, and then we're going to look back at the lines. So what we'll do here is, so we're just going to read this over first. So we've gone through this in detail. Like we, we studied Gideon when we were examining the foundation because we studied Jeff's studies on it. And then we went through it and, and drew it out on lines. And, and at that time, I was impressed for what that's worth, to see that Judges 6, 7, and 8 each were, had their own separate lines. But what we hadn't done is we hadn't really developed a line completely for all of Gideon in that study. I mean, Jeff had a line for it uh, in the past. But we also know that Jeff, in his original understanding of Gideon, hadn't applied it to July 18th until uh, into 2019, after the, the departure of Parminder's group. And um, so he would refer to it once in a while, but he never did a, uh, an extensive study on Gideon. We had to sort of um, complete the ideas ourselves of how to apply this. Because originally the idea of Gideon is that it related to the Sunday law. But we can see that what we experienced in our lines was the Sunday law. Now, we took the position that Judges 7 is a zoom into July 18, 2020. That is, Judges 6 was more about November 9th, 2019. Judges 7, more about July 18th. And Judges 8, about December 25th, 2021. Now, at first, I thought, you know, that these were, it's a type of repeat and enlarge, but with a different emphasis. So, um, so that's how we had had settled that. And now we're looking at putting this on a line, but we realize that we have uh, a line of Gideon that, that it, just like we had um, in the study with Deborah and Barak, where we had the line primarily as the 777 days from September 23rd. Uh, 2017 to November 9th, 2019. So dealing with Parminder's history 
and the end of that history. And Gideon picks up from there, from November 9th, 2019, and addresses the 777 structure in our history, but with two different lines is what we're uh, uh, sort of trying to address. How, how is that possible that we can have these two separate lines from Gideon? So as we look at Judges 7, so we're going to read through this. So this is the second angel's message in those lines. It's the arrival of the second angel's message. And, and it doesn't mean that it just starts there, because when you zoom into a line, of course, uh, you know, you, you when we wrote out Judges 7, it, it went earlier in the history all the way to September 7th. So it re reached back there, uh, 2019. But here we're looking at it as, as the arrival of the second angel and um, it's also going to address things in this line uh, prior to July 18, when we zoom into it. But here now we're going to be addressing the second angel, its formalization and empowerment. So that should all be in Judges chapter 7, though I know when we drew out the line, Judges 8 and Judges 6 were part of chapter 7. But you'll see what I mean once we go through this. So it says, then Jer Jeroboam, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Harad, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, mine own hand has saved me. Now, therefore, go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people twenty and two thousand, and there remained ten thousand. Um, we'll, we'll come back to this. I'm just going to try to read through this main section here. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people... Um, the people are yet too many, bring them down unto the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought down the people unto the water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink. And the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were 300 men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the 300 men that lapped will I save you, and deliver the Midianites into thine hand. And let all the other people go every man unto his place. So the people took victuals in their hand and their trumpets and sent all the rest of Israel, every man unto his tent and retained those 300 men. And the host of Midian was beneath him in the valley. Okay, so we have this separation of these groups of people. Now, if we're going to go to the lines here. So if we look at the line and we're saying that Judges chapter seven is the second angel's message. Um, then what, what would this match in Millerite history? And how would this separation, what would it match in Millerite history? Would this match the separation from the other Protestant churches, the first of the separations? Okay, so, so we know April 19th, 1844, we mark as the first disappointment. And prior to the first disappointment, people give different numbers, but the number that, that I like is that there was 500,000 Millerites. Now, of course, many of these would be people who hadn't experienced persecution. They were just in favor of this idea that Jesus is coming back. Um, and so, so those Millerites, 500,000, are going to be whittled down by that the failure of Miller's prediction and the passing of the time of Miller's prediction to about 50,000 Millerites that remain. So would that be a parallel to this 
uh, what was it, 220,000? What was the number that left? Um, I don't know why my mind can't remember that number. Um, yeah. I think that's probably 20 and 2000, 20 and 2000 verse 3. Yeah, so yeah, 22, that's what it is, 22,000, not 200, I was trying to remember. So 22,000, and that's 10,000 remain. So that means there was 32,000 to begin, right? Right. Yeah, so, so from 32,000, they get down to 10,000. Now, uh, does anybody remember what we, how we dealt with the symbolism that's here? in that verse, 20, 20 and 2,000, and then the 10,000. Because we've dealt with 10,000 before. We've also dealt with 220 and 22 and, yeah. two, you know, 22,000, so. Yeah, I so, mean, yeah, go on. Isn't that just a symbol of restoration? Yeah, so the 22 is a symbol of restoration. Um, but these are going to be those that, that end up leaving. Now, the number that remains 10,000, we know that if we took that as, as days, that it ends up being 27 years, 0. 0.3785, uh, right? So you have a 273 there in that calculation, which is a symbol of the Levites. Now, um, so if we're looking at this line, though, internally, I mean, this, this is relating to messages. Now, we, we do have the symbol of the Levites there, the March 27, 2020 date in the one line. But now what we're trying to do here is we're trying to address how these lines, how we're going to take these um chapters and how we're going to to produce two lines i mean that's the thing that i've been struggling with how do i decide that that this is going to represent two different histories so um so if we look at july 18th as the arrival of the second angel's message but there must be two different ways in which that we we can understand that is and maybe i'm just stuck on this idea that we have to have a darkness, two different darknesses, right? And that the main idea that we have is that the one line addresses the Trump prediction and the other line addresses uh, the Nashville prediction. Let's, let's just simplify it in that way. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to throw a strange question at you. Yeah. Is the answer in the name? In the name of... Gideon and Jerubal. Okay. So that's interesting because we have two different, I never thought of that. So we have, well, let's go there. So when we look at the fact that Gideon has two different names, just that itself um, suggests that there's two different ideas here. And right. <clears throat> now what is the, why is he called Jerubal? Well, the name means let Baal plead. Okay. Or contend. Right? Okay. But <clears throat> I'm going back since I had, I'd gone over some of mm -hmm. what had been, pro, what had been posted on Elder Jeff's presentations from 2010, as yeah. well as going through the line simply presented. Yeah. So <clears throat> is it possible that we could separate this where Jerubal and Gideon are like the Uli and the Hittichel visions? Mm. In other words, when Elder Jeff was talking about this, yeah. one, one comment that he was greatly criticized about was that one vision of the river 
led to the sea of glass and the other led to the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. So is it possible that when we're looking at this with Jerubal and Gideon that we're being shown the separation that will occur not only within the movement, but within the church itself? Yeah. So, so we have this idea that these are these two separate lines. So here's how we looked at it. We, we said we have two separate lines and it can represent um, the foolish and the wise, right? The two different classes. We've, we've Correct. said, we say that, you know, the line dealing with uh, December 6th and de December 25th and June 27th and all that, that's primarily about Nashville prediction. And um, so the 187 there in that line, 187 days, that is, we already have these two periods of 187 days that we had recognized, the one from the publication of the ad in the Tennessean uh, to December uh, 25th, 2020, which is going to be uh, the bombing of Nashville. Um, so that, that line is definitely about the Nashville prediction. Um, but the next line is addressing uh, the 100 days of prayer and the 10 days of prayer, which are then connected to um, the bombing of Nashville, but also to the Trump prediction. So it brings in that date for the bombing of Nashville. It becomes a different way mark in this line uh, on the bottom, but we still have the 187. Then we have the 10 days of prayer, but it starts with January 6th. So these two different crises, so to speak, March 27th begins this 100 days of prayer to address the pandemic. But the January 6th one was already set in advance. The fact that on the first day of those 10 days of prayer, we have the siege of Washington and that it's 187 days from the 100 days of prayer is pretty remarkable. But we can see that this is that in this Trump prediction, um, we also have this March 27th date, which we don't have in the line above. The other one's about FFA, right? June 22nd, that's the symbol for FFA. So the top line is an internal line. The bottom line is, is an external line. Now, we're saying you're saying that we could also take these lines and we can look at Gideon and Jerubal. And if we were going to do this, then the way that I would do it is I would move Gideon down here to this line. So I'm just going to move it over to the side here, this small room. And, um, and then I would put this line here as Jerubal. Why would I do that? Why would I make this Jerubal? Let him contend and this one to be a warrior. How does that relate to what we've just talked about? Because one is more focused on things as man would see them, the other would be focused more on the internal work that leads us to the development of a Christ-like character. Yes. So this is, and, and this is also, even if we relate it to the whole idea of uh, the Midianites, which is strife, right? That's the enemy. Correct. It represents this strife that exists. This is the contention that has gone on in the movement. And this, right. this contention, of course, primarily deals with, with Nashville on the surface. So that's going to be uh, the Nashville prediction. But with Gideon, uh, this, this means a warrior, right? Um, the idea of the name of Gideon is a feller that is a warrior. Um, um, and uh, 
you know, a hewer. So, so this is from this word to fell a tree, you know, which means uh, generally to destroy anything that is cut asunder, in sunder, down, off, hew down. Um, and this would apply much more to what we see as far as the Trump predictions, because it deals with the kingdoms of this world. Um, you know, who hew down his branches, you know, so it's it's kind of reminds me a little bit of Daniel chapter four. Um, <clears throat> so so does that does this kind of make sense for what we're doing? That we have basically two different lines of thought in Gideon, these two classes, the two different predictions, and the two different, um, we have a group that's a warrior, that's victorious, another one, one that's struggling. So uh, any, any other thoughts on this, of how we could understand this? Well, one of the verses that also comes to me is Hosea 6.5. Therefore, have I hewed them by the prophets? I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and thy judgments are as the light that goeth forth. I should remember that because it's one of my scripture signs, but. Uh, <laughs> no reminder uh, there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And the verse four says, O oh, Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O oh, Judah, what shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is as a morning cloud. And as the early do, it goes away. Yeah, so uh, so Ephraim and Judah are mentioned there. Um, yeah, so there's lots there. Um, any more thoughts on what we're looking at? Is this with Gideon and Gerald Bale showing us the battle that goes on within each one of us? Well, all the lines always do, right? So, But this is a bit more pointed. Yeah. So what specific aspects are you talking about that, that this is showing? Well, when we're looking at this from the study that we've done on Gideon, we have a, a man that chooses to be led of God, questions in the right way so that he comes to an understanding of what God would have him to do and what God would have him to know. Mm -hmm. But then later, he makes the choice to construct his own ephod, <clears throat> to do things as a priest when he definitely was not called to the priesthood because yeah. how many how many warrior priests are we shown in the bible well i mean david was forbidden to to complete the temple because he was a warrior and that's why uh, solomon completed the temple right but david was of the tribe of judah yeah how many warrior priests are we shown in the Bible itself? Um, I don't know. I don't think we're shown any. Yeah. Well, the, the priest, that wasn't their role. Right. That's the point. Mm -hmm. What about Phineas? Phineas? Yes. Okay. Was he not acting as God would have him to act in defense of God's law and character? Yes. Did he go out and seek battle as David did? Not as David, but he was in a sense warrior-like in the action that he took. Correct. I, I will agree with your point, but this was a 
a battle that went on within the the camp of Israel, within the body of Israel. Because they had yeah. cho they had chosen instead of to follow God's law and to repent that this man bringing Cosby into his tent was not acting as one that had developed the character of Christ. So again, I would I would have to say that Phinehas was defending God's character. He was not going out to battle as Saul and David had done. He, he was not so much a warrior. He was a priest defending that and showing the type of character that we need to have as we deal with situations within the movement and within the church. Right, okay. Yeah, oh. other than Phineas, I can't really think of any other one comes to mind concerning Levites. I would agree with you. Um, Adeline? Yeah, so so anyway, when we when we look at these characteristics of Jero Bale, um, now of course it's Bale can just mean Lord, but in this case it's it's his name is given because of um, tearing down the the altar of Baal. And so it's you know, it Baal should be able to uh, plead for himself so to speak but um so we're gonna we're, we're placing this with the nashville prediction now the nashville of course deals with uh, uh the temple there the parthenon with the the athenian goddess uh, what's the name of the goddess is it athena is that it the goddess of yes Jesus. yeah okay and um so so in a sense this is addressing this tearing down of an altar too right but we know that the prediction didn't come to pass so one of the things about this line is is that this is about an internal work that has to happen in us now you know some people might sort of complain that we've sort of spiritualized the way the whole July 18, 2020 prediction um, in that sense. But I don't believe that we have. Um, we know that Nashville will be destroyed. But the first work that had to be done was something within this movement, that this, that this Gideon judge is about a separation that happens. Um, within this movement, just as it happened in Millerite history. But all of these things that we predicted will come to pass. It's just that we can't know when they will come to pass. And, and, and the thing that I struggle with the most about all of this that God has given us, and, and particularly given me in my study of biblical chronology, is how does this relate to the message that Adventists need to hear. And we know that the witness is not so much going to be, you know, all these details of chronology, but the changed characters that happen. And that's why this movement has to go to an upper room, so to speak, and truly be converted so that God can use us. And, and it seems unlikely that God would have gone through all this work for no purpose. Because, I mean, this, this is 
all of this chronology, I mean, these are things that, that, that are all through the Bible that are built into creation. And they're witnessing to this movement about a work that needs to be done. And, and we can't imagine that this is just for a few people on this earth that we somehow, you know, have to have this understanding so that we can truly be converted. And that's all it does. I mean, we have to believe that there is eternal purposes that go far beyond us as individuals in what we are learning. I mean, we have this story of Gideon and we have all of these amazing uh, coincidences, let's use that word, things that happen together. Uh, in what has happened in this movement and, and what has happened in the past. So, so what we're struggling with right now in this movement is how do we relate to July 18 regarding the Nashville prediction and how do we address uh, the Trump prediction, right? And, and this, it has created a division in this movement like people have left this movement with the failure of those things. But the purpose of those things um, still isn't fully understood. We don't know how things are going to unfold particularly. So, so the fact that we have these two lines, I'm, I'm still fascinated by it. I mean, maybe I shouldn't be. But we can see now we have a few different reasons. We have the two classes. We have Nashville and Trump. We have Jeroboam and Gideon. Um, so how do we how do we proceed in understanding what's happened with July 18th and the separation that's going on? I mean, where did the separation occur? Is the first separation where you have the the 22,000 leave and the 10,000 continue. Uh, which line are we going to put that in? Uh, and, and where would we mark that way mark? I mean, is that something that happens before the arrival of the second angel, so to speak? Yes. Okay. So so when we say that that this is about July 18th, I mean, we could even take this story and we can look at that March 27th date and we can say those that if we reach this back, see, that's part of the problem I'm having with this. Cause when we, we did this line before um, here, you could see that this line, this was, this is how we looked at judges chapter seven. It started with this call, which we used from Judges 6, 33 to 35, and we put that as September 7th, 2019. And then we use this 32,000 minus 22,000 equals 10,000. And, and we put this as Jud Judges 3, and we put this as November 9th, 2019. So we took this as the separation that happened with November 9th, 2019. So, so we reached back but now we're saying it's the arrival of the second angel, but yet we still have to go back to 2019 and say that that's the first major separation, correct? Right. Okay. And then, um, when we counted 10,000 days from November 9th, 2019, we came up to uh, March 27th. I think that's what happened, right? I'm just seeing, yeah, did I get that correct? Yeah. So, um, and actually where we counted from was November 9th, um, 1989. So we use that date. So if you count from November 9th, 1989, you come to March 27th, um, uh, 2017. 
right? Which which relates into that uh, that line, that whole seven 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 chiasm. So anyway, we can connect November 9th to March twenty seventh. So so wherever we put that division, that separation, I think symbolically it goes to November 9th, 2019. So that means the Judges chapter seven, even though it's about the arrival of the second angel, um, it still has these other dates in it. And so that's why we can take that March uh, 27th date and in 2020, and we can, we can connect this to this line having to do with Gideon. So this is this separation that happens. Now, as far as putting it in a line, the March 27th date is in the line that deals with Gideon, which we say also deals with the Trump prediction and the, and the message to the Levites. So this is dealing with the external events, the pandemic and uh, the siege of Washington. It was when United States falls. So United States falls to the globalists on January 6th. And, and we can see those two symbols are tied together in that ones remember if we use that candlestick uh the formalization of the first message aligns with the empowerment of the second message and you can see that in the line above with the line of jerobeal how those are connected now here in this line we have the 187 days um but if you know you just put the starts both of these are starting days of prayer march 27 2020 is the beginning of 100 days of prayer, and January 6, 2021 is the beginning of 10 days of prayer. So, is that making sense? Yeah. Okay, so, so we can see in this line, there's this separation, and then March 27th date is still part of chapter seven. So six, seven, and eight are witnessing to these lines. Um, so in this, in these lines, we're we're still we're still looking at them broadly, right? We're not going to say chapter six just gives you the the first three, and chapter seven just gives you the second angel's message, like the next three waymarks, and then chapter eight just gives you the third waymark. We we still, in a sense, can see how these lines. Um, each one of these way marks encompasses the whole line to some degree, right? That is the first angel isn't just about what happens up to July 18th. Right. Okay. So that, so that's something about these lines that, that, um, uh, that we haven't, we hadn't really fully understood. You know, we would look at the line like the arrival of the first angel, and then you have this increase of knowledge and not realizing, well, the darkness is continuing through the whole line and there's constantly an increase of knowledge or an increase of light. That light is continuing to unfold. Each of the way marks is itself a reform line that is addressing the period of darkness that's existing and, and giving this increase of light. And every time that happens, there are people who are being tested by that. Now, when we relate this then to our, our individual life, um, now we have an internal and external. Do we have an internal and external in our individual lives, in our individual reform lives? Would you repeat that question, please? We have an internal line and an external line. Right. They witness to each other, but they do exist. Correct. Right. So, so we have the stuff that's going on inside of us that nobody ever sees. Now, right. it's going to be manifest to some degree by what happens externally. And those would be the, the, the events in our lives um, that that can be witnessed by others, but inside there is this other battle going on, right? This contention, the, the, the Jerobeal, right? Contending with Baal, in a sense, 
with with self. But Gideon is is the name Gideon is expressing that external battle. It's related to the internal because the two go hand in hand. But these are the events outside of us, the effect that we have on others because of what's happening internally. Does that make any sense? Mm-hmm. Well, Heidi understands. Me, so I think you're getting the point. Yeah. Okay. So, so the same thing happens in the movement. That is, we understand that when we go through a reform line, we're passing over the ground of fulfilled prophecy. But a reform line could not exist if no one is reformed. Right? If nobody's giving a message, you know, God can't just artificially just create reform lines. You know, events are not just happening without something happening to God's people. But those events are, in a sense, a result of what God's people are do- doing. Correct? Agreed. If Miller doesn't take up the study of God's word, if no one does, you know, if there's no person that God can call to do that work, that reform line doesn't happen. If they don't give that message, that reform line doesn't occur. Now, God in his providence foresees all things and ordains them, not in the way of controlling them and predestinating them in this in the Calvinist sense, but foreseeing them and somehow through his ability to give us free will and choices while still guiding those choices through circumstances and events that that we have no control over. And so, you know, we end up with these reform lines and we're passing through them. And what's happening to us is in a sense, our response to those reform lines create those reform lines. And it's it's kind of a, a terrible thing in some ways. It's just like Judas. I mean, did he have the free will to make a choice? But yet it was prophesied that he would betray Christ. On December 6, 2020, when, you know, the people who were left at FFA put out that declaration they were not cognizant of the symbolic representation that was being given by having it occur on that date. But in a sense, they had no control over that, right? God had foreseen that. But in a sense, they had a choice, right? Right. December 6, 2020. They had a choice not to uh, make the decisions that they did. But yet we can see that, so I'm just fascinated by how powerful these lines are in the sense that history unfolds in this way, and we are a part of it. We have our personal reform lines, and they're intertwined with these events that have happened in the world and these events that have happened in this movement. And this should give us a confidence as we move towards the camp meeting this summer, even though I'm you know, apprehensive about it to some degree, you know, how are things going to turn out? Is anybody going to even want to go? Um, but yet believing that God's leading us in that direction, that we, we actually have to come uh, together. And, and people have a choice whether they want to go to that camp meeting or not. And some people may want to, but not end up there because of circumstances they couldn't overcome. And I'm not saying that the camp meeting is the only option that this movement has, but to some degree, I I believe that it has to happen. That that if we cannot reconcile, if this movement can't become united, I don't really know what becomes of this movement. But we can look at the past lines here And we see that God's providence is always being worked out. His will is always being worked out. 
And so our responsibility is to, to be obedient to God, to do what he asks us to do each day, and to trust the results to him. So that's one of the things I get from looking at these two lines together. Um, God is really uh, interested in what this movement is doing. And, and we should take that seriously. But these events that happened in the world are directly related to what this movement has done. That's, that's the thing I see being witnessed here. So we have this internal and external line, and it relates to us as individuals as well. Okay, any other thoughts on this? Before we go on and read a bit more. I think you're, I think you're putting together a good foundation. So, um, so uh, Judges uh, 7, 9, it came to pass that same night. So he's got this 300 men. And it says, it came to pass that same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered it into thine hand. But if thou fear to go down, go thou with uh, Pura, thy servant, down to the host. And thou shalt hear what they say, and afterward shall thine hands be strengthened to go down unto the host. Then went he down with Pira, his servant, unto the outside of the armed men that were in the host. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude, and their camels were without number as by the sand of the sea side for multitude. And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto to his fellow and said behold i dreamed a dream and lo a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of midian and came unto a tent and smote it that it fell and overturned it that the tent lay along and his fellow answered and said this is nothing else save the sword of gideon the son of joash a man of israel for into his hand hath god delivered midian and all the host and it was so when gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof that he worshiped and returned into the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. And he did, right, so let's just deal with this part of this dream. So, what is this dream? How is it illustrated in these lines? Um, how do we, how do, can we possibly interpret this? Are the dreams the arrival of the second angel? Okay. Um, I would think that that probably would be correct, but how how do we how do we explain that in looking at these two lines we have in front of us? So we're saying July eighteenth is. The arrival of the second angel. Now you've already placed that directly in both lines. Right. So the point being the first angel in <clears throat> fearing God, respecting his word, respecting his instruction. The second angel in giving glory to him or as as we have also been addressing that babylon is fallen here we have the the second angel coming to this in these dreams where gideon is being shown that the midianites 
and those of the children of the East are soon to fall at his hand. Okay. Now, so we say it's the arrival of the second angel, but the dream seems to me to be June 21st and 22nd. That is... On the line of Jerubal or the line of Gideon? That would be the line of Jerubal or Jeroboam, right? So what I see is there is this message that he has to give. and But that's it's going to be symbolized by him being by go, going down to the camp, right? So he's going to be instructed, um, go down, get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered it into thine hand. But if thou fear to go down, go thou with Pura thy servant down to the host. Now, there's a number of things here. Um, now, uh, Pura, right, uh, his name means bow. It also refers to uh, foliage, right? Um, or ornamentation sometimes. That is the foliage, including the limbs as bright green, right? So that's the, the name of this uh, person. And now it's also, uh, we have a date here, which is uh, the 10th day of the seventh month. Right, if we're going to take Judges 7 and 10. Um, now, what would be the significance of that? Other than the fact that July 18 uh, is a symbol of the 10th day of the seventh month, because the 10th day of the seventh month is the 187th day of the year. Um, but the fact that this is in this Judges 7 10, that he's, he's told, if you, are, if you fear, you, you can take your servant, Pura. Did we determine what his name, what the servant's name means? Well, it just means foliage or, or branch, branches. So the covering. The, okay, but the branch of what? Well, it's just of, of anything. It's a bough or a branch. It's the foliage. It, it's like an ornamentation or the covering of a, of a tree. So but are we dealing are we dealing with the the foliage like that of the the fig tree, or are we dealing with a different type of foliage all altogether? Um. Well. Well. I, Probably the fig tree, any kind of tree. Now, we put Judges 10 in our line of chapter 7. Yeah, there's the servant, the branch. Uh, but we put it as Judges 7, uh, 10 to 11, as July 10th to 11th, 2020. Now, um, we don't have these in the lines of Gideon, per se. That is, we don't have um, on either of these lines the July 10th date. Um, but the July 10th date related primarily to um, that 777 chiasm uh, that started with the Mayan calendar and, and all the things that happened from the Mayan calendar. So the 273 were connected to that. And um, so, so the thing is, we have symbols that address both of these lines. So even though we have July 10th, which is a symbol of the 10th day of the seventh month. We don't have it on here, but it is an important part of that structure dealing with July 4th to July 18th. Um, so I don't know how to uh, address it here particularly. But what I am saying is that this is a confirmation that Gideon gets in in this dream that he witnesses. And that, that dream, of course, he says, I dreamed a dream, right? That's, uh, in a sense, a doubling, right? So, so. Um, in a sense, yes. So, so Gideon and Pura, 
this covering are going to go down to the camp of the Midianites. And, and they're going to hear this dream. And so, so this dream, we have uh, a cake of barley bread that tumbles into the camp of the Midianites. And it came unto a tent and smote it that it fell and overturned it that the tent lay along. So, so in this Judges 7.13, um, one thing we see here is these, these two numbers, 7 and 13, a number of perfection and a number dealing with um, uh, which is 7 plus 6. So that's a symbol of the great controversy. So 13 is. Um, so this man told a dream to his fellow and we have this barley bread um, that tumbles into the host of the Midianite camp, came unto a tent. That tent is that 168 number, which 168 times 77 is my home address as a child. Um, so, so this symbol is here dealing with this. Uh, it's also the number of hours in a week. And he's overturned it. Um, so basically, it means to turn head over heels, um, so to speak. It's going to tumble. Um, and, and it's going to cause this tent to tumble. And it's got this word, nafal, lay along, to fall, basically um, to lie down, right? So to lay along it's kind of a strange translation um so what it says here in young's literal translation uh it cometh in unto the tent smiteth it and it falleth and turneth it upwards and the tent hath fallen so that's what the guy says and and of course he's told that this is the sword of gideon the son of joash a man of Israel, for into his hand hath God delivered Midian and all the host. So here, this guy, in, in in a sense, interprets this dream and tells you know his the guy who had the dream what it means. Um, I'm not sure why he's going to hang around, but but that's what he believes is that Gideon is going to be victorious over their whole camp. So what does this mean? Isn't he being shown that by the cake of barley, that one that views themselves as unworthy will have dominion or victory over all of the enemies? Right. So this is not something that's... Uh... that's likely to to be victorious. It's something that, because Gideon is not trusting in self, he's trusting in God. Right. I mean, he, he's whittled down this army under God's direction from 32,000 to 300 men. And, and still he needs this dream as a witness, of course, what a God will do, right? Because God wants him to know that he will be victorious. And, and I take these as a witness of that we have had with our chronology. That these dreams, so to speak, because in some ways that's what this chronology is. In some ways, I mean, it's been given to us through dreams, you know, at least in part. But also the visions of the Old Testament and the New Testament, you know, God's prophecies. It's prophecy that is being shown here in this dream. So we have a more, more sure word of prophecy in what we are doing. 
Now, as far as putting it on a line, right? So when we look at our lines, and if there's any other thoughts on that. So we can see that the Gideon is humble. He's a humble means that God uses. Right? He's not, this is not some, God isn't in these last days using the organized church or some huge organization to spread the message. Most of the Christian world has followed the world in how it's promoting truth. And we even see this within ministries within Adventism. Ministries that used to be very simple in how they presented the gospel uh, now have glitzy sort of videos and everything has to be so fancy. Even this movement tried that with uh, um, the video that I was a part of, the Desolations of Jerusalem. But I don't believe that the work is going to be done in that way. I mean, I do believe we need videos that are educational, but I don't think they have to be glitzy. Because that's not the means that God is going to use. He's going to use character. Okay, Second Chronicles 2.10, Angela. Yes, I'll, I'll read. I'll, I'll, I was brought to this. Uh, Behold, I will give to thy servants. There we have Fura, right? Or Fura. Yeah. <laughs> the hewers, Gideon, that cut timber, 20,000 measures of beaten wheat and 20,000 measures of barley. There's the barley. And 20,000 baths of wine and 20,000 baths of oil. And this is to do with, do, do with the building of, of Solomon's temple. Yeah. But, you know, you have the 20,000 again, and this time it's times four. Yeah. With the uh, 32,000 being reduced to 300, means that uh, 31,700 um, were left aside in total. Yeah. So you have there 317. Now that reminds me of the, the week of Christ in the midst of the week. Yeah. I don't know if that. Yeah, well, I would think the 317. So that's the, the 31 AD and the 7, yeah, the week. Uh, I think that's a valid symbol. So that, I mean, the midst of the week, that that is what this line is about. Right, this, this 777 represents that, that idea. Huh. Now, so the, the problem that I'm having is we're, we're doing this. We can see that when we go through this story, it's going to witness to both of these lines with these symbols. You know, the 10,000 is going to witness to March 27th. Now, what about uh, the 317 then? I mean, we say it's in the midst of the week. It can relate to July 18 as, this, in a sense, the center of this structure, uh, though not, not literally. So what's, what's being, being illustrated by these symbols?
I mean, it is kind of interesting too that the center of this this structure. So we have how many weeks from November 9th to December twenty fifth. Hundred and eleven. So one hundred and eleven weeks. So when is the center week? Would that be the fifty sixth? Yeah. Well, the fifty sixth week. Yeah. So so if you go um, from November 9th, so that's going to be a Sabbath, and so. The next day is going to begin a week, right? Yep. So you have 385 days that cover um, from November 9th, 2019. But technically, I guess you would say, um, yeah, we can just count from November 9th. So if you count 385 days... That's going to bring you to this week that's going to start on November 29th. So the, the last week is November 29th, and it's going to end on, right, so, so that's going to be the last day of the week, right, I guess is what you're saying. So, so that the next week is going to start on uh, how would we do this? So you're going to have that week is going to be the 55th week. So the 56th week begins on December 6th, 2020. Does that make sense? I don't know if I explained it well. So if you're going to take it as weeks, the, the, let me see if I'm doing this right. So 55 weeks brings you to November 28th. So November 29th is the beginning. Is that the beginning of the 56th week? I think. So the end of the 56th week, it would be uh, December 5th. So that'd be the 57th week that starts on December 6th. So that's so, December. You're saying that part of November of 2020 yeah so if i go from november 9th and i just count weeks uh, i mean i did it with math but i'm just gonna go so that's that's gonna be a sabbath right so the next day november 10th is the start of a new week so that's gonna be the first week Yeah, so November 29th is the start of the 56th week, I think. I got to go back and do it again. I'm just using the clicker there. But so so the center then is, you know, December 1st is the center of that structure. But that's that's in the the 50 Fifth week or the fifty? That'd be in the fifty-sixth week. Why are we searching in the weeks? Well, because we're trying to find the center of these one hundred and eleven weeks. And all I'm saying is that the center is December sixth. That week is the end of the the, cent the center, because December first is the exact center. And so. There's 111 weeks, and December 6th is technically the start of the 56th week, or the 57th week, I mean, right? People understand what I'm doing? I know Samuel didn't understand. So Iran saying December 5th was the end of the middle week. That's what I thought. The next was the declaration. Okay. So, so this is exactly what I was trying to figure out. Exactly. Amazing. Yeah. So you have the center week, the week of Christ, right? 
the center of that is that week that ended on December 5th. So when um, Daniel Vanderhorst did his presentation and they said, what was the word they said? Uh, can't remember. I mean, they, they wanted to stop and shut it down. Okay, that's what I thought. Shut it down. Right. So Daniel Vanderhorst is giving his personal testimony. And they say, shut it down. Um, I think that was Larry Hine, if I remember, but it could have been someone else. Uh, could have been Larry Lesher, but I think it was Larry Hine said, shut it down. So, so I ended up, you know, uh, downloading that video and uh, putting it up. It's on my YouTube page. Um, but the next day they put out the declaration. So can we see that? After the week of Christ, there is a rejection. So the center of the midst of the week. I think it's as clear as, as good glass. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's the crucifixion of Christ afresh. Correct. So I think that's that's pretty interesting that we get this uh, symbol here of the 317. Of those that are left over so those are the ones that are so we can see that this this cutting off isn't just about the beginning of this line because this is about this line altogether can we see that this line is the 70th week now what happened on december 25th 2021 um it is is rather remarkable because we had Stephen who had an understanding that came to him that should have been obvious to us a long time ago. That is, we counted 777 years from 457 BC. It brings us to uh, 321 AD, the Sunday law. Right? And what else? What else? What else is significant about December twenty fifth, twenty twenty one? Okay, so the Trump Trump prediction is revived. So we're going to have Colin, who's going to. Do his presentation on the Trump prediction. Then seven weeks later, Adilio is going to do his presentation on the mandates. And those two are tied together, as we saw with the wave offering and um, Pentecost. So the, the, those symbols are there. And, and so one of the things we know is that what Colin found and what Odilio found are not something to be just set aside and... and um, you know, ignored. That is, we believe that light came to this movement from Stephen, from Odilio, and from uh, Colin uh, that has to come together. That is, this movement is being given light, but it's not being given light to one person. We don't have one person who's the leader of this movement. We have Christ, who is the leader of this movement. And we are to cooperate with Christ in understanding truth. And some people would like to be running things for some reason, uh, which would be a pretty scary thing to be in that position. But some people want to be in charge. They want to be in control of what's happening. But I'd much rather God be in control of what's happening. But he is in control of what's happening. But he's given us a message that relates to, to this, because we have a December 25th, 2020, a December 25th, 2021. And this is also going to be tied in judges to December 25th, 2022, right? So what has happened in this movement in our understanding and studying of truth um, is definitely not something that uh, was created by man. This is all God. So, so we need to understand this, and, and we don't yet. I mean, I definitely don't fully understand what's going on and how things are to unfold. 
But we have learned a lot about what our present responsibility is. And that's our responsibility ourselves to be converted. And then to do, to allow God to lead and guide by his providences. Um, and through our connection with him, to know his voice, to know what it is we are to do. And so, so we have a lot ahead of us that still has to be accomplished. So anyway, we, we were going over a bit late. We started late, but because um, uh, we had some testimony and, uh, and things that we need to pray for. So um, anyway, um, we need to close with prayer, but we'll come to this tomorrow. And, and hopefully, um, you know, God can help us to sort this out a little more clearly. But, but we definitely have some ideas here on what God is showing us. Okay. Any final comments before we close with prayer? Just uh, pointing out here, we know that uh, we went from 32 to 10. And we have only two off there going to 10. So I'm just wondering, can, I'm just, could we connect that to the 22nd of the 10th month? October 22. Can we do that? Yeah, because you got 10 and 22. Yes. Yeah, we already, we already had done that, didn't we? Or... Yeah. I can't remember. Yeah, yep. that's right. Yeah, so we have, um, well, we have, you know, Ju uh, Judges chapter 7, verse 10, gave us the 10th day of the seventh month as a symbol. Right? So, but yeah, I... Uh, I don't know if we ever looked at that number particularly as it. Um, the other thing is if we take 300 from 22,000, you get 2170. And that's midnight as a symbol, right? It's also a symbol for the midst of the week as well, just because it's the middle of the, the 62 weeks. And if you cut 62 weeks in half, you get... Uh, 31 weeks right so those numbers mm -hmm. all so we get that from that 32,000 22,000 and 10,000 we get two different ways we get the midst of the week and we also get midnight which is July 21st which is the middle of the chiasm right which is the midst of the week right so that's pretty profound okay so thanks for that yeah okay okay yeah, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for this day. And again, we are grateful for how you answer our prayers. We ask that we can continue to pray and seek you and trust in you. That self can be destroyed. And that only you uh, will be revealed in us. Be with us throughout this day. Bring us together again according to thy will is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.